The press said Led Zeppelin 3 was an album from a band that had stopped trying hard. In fact, it opened quite a few doors for them. Fans hailed Led Zeppelin 3 as their acoustic album. In fact, every track displays a fair bit of electric sounds. Led Zeppelin 3 sums up all that is good about Led Zeppelin's music and all that is bad about Led Zeppelin's approach to music. A proof that these four were more than troglodytes playing too loud for comfort rockers. An attempt to start building a mythology on the mystique surrounding them. A source of difficult questions about us. What's the hype all about? What does this record say about the band that recorded it? About our world? Let's find out in this episode of... If music could talk... 1970. It must have been late April or May. Robert Plant and Jimmy Page walked into Bronner Air, a quiet cottage in the Welsh countryside, with no running water nor electricity. The ideal spot for some relax after 18 months of unforgiving work at breakneck speed. With John Bonham and John Paul Jones, Page and Plant were now superstars. Jimmy had quickly put Led Zeppelin together on the ashes of the Yardbirds. The idea was to push everyone else off the stage, as he said. Led Zeppelin, named after a remark of the Who's John Entwistle, not Keith Moon, about the prospect of such a band, hadn't gone down. In fact, it seemed they could only go up. August 1968, the band's first rehearsal in London. September 1968, the band's first tour in Scandinavia made a sensation. October 1968, Still without a label, they completed their first album, Led Zeppelin. The band had composed and rehearsed the material in Scandinavia, recording it pretty much live in just 36 hours. Page had acted as producer. He paid the studio and art costs out of his own pocket. A thousand seven hundred eighty-two pounds almost 35,000 pounds in today's money. Atlantic Records signed them without even listening to the master. Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones were well known in the recording circles. With these two giants together in the same band, the executives thought, what could possibly go wrong? With a couple of notable exceptions, Led Zeppelin was harshly criticized by the press. But it didn't matter. Commercially, the album was a hit. The four musicians ate North America alive. Led Zeppelin outperformed every other band with the intensity of their live act. Non-stop touring ensued. Another album, Led Zeppelin II, was composed and recorded on the road. An even bigger blockbuster. And thanks to the band's shrewd manager, Peter Grant, Led Zeppelin kept raking in money. By December 1969, they had some five million dollars in the bag, coming from their North American tours alone. One can't overestimate the magnitude of Led Zeppelin's success. How much the band wanted to play by its own rules. Check this out. They turned down an offer to appear at a certain festival in Woodstock. Yes, that festival. Time for a break. It was only days before Led Zeppelin's momentous performance at the Bath Festival of Blues and Progressive Music. Only days before they would be hailed as rock gods in their homeland too. But while Robert and Jimmy wanted to recharge their batteries, they also needed to think about the band's third album. Was it best to give the public what they wanted? Nah. It was time to try something different. But what? Hello, Top Patters. This is Simon Mas, a guy who squeezed your lemon and gave it to another man. No, wait. 
it was Bron Ur Air and its surrounding that suggested a course of action. Why not make a gentler record? The prospect seemed intriguing. Jimmy Page had a thing for British folk music. Bert Jansch, Davy Graham, John Fahey, their timeless acoustic sound. Most importantly, the approach would have proven the critics wrong. The press had been going on about Led Zeppelin being one-dimensional, their songs all sounding the same, loud, rough and heavy. The band, and Page in particular, had grown to detest these hacks and their preconceived notions. Jimmy recalled the derogative comparisons with the Jeff back group, the backhanded compliments. Yes, it was time to show them. Jimmy and Robert started to write in the Welsh countryside, acoustic guitar in hand, a mic'd voice and a cheap tape recorder. Eleven songs were completed or started during the holiday. Only three were to end on Led Zeppelin III, but the die was cast. This was to be the basis of the band's sound for the new album. The relaxed feel was extended to the recording sessions too. Led Zeppelin had already recorded since Have Been Loving You in November 1969. It had been a normal studio session. The song was considered for Led Zeppelin II before being replaced by Whole of Love. No sweat. The piece came handy for three. But now it was time to try something new. The band and their entourage moved to Hadley Grange. It was a 1795 house, a grade 2 historic building in Hampshire. Another countryside location, damp, with no heating, but lovely. Page Plant Jones and Bonham lived on the premises, rehearsing and recording. They decided to let the music sink in deep and slow. They could work whenever they felt ready for however long they pleased. Using the Rolling Stones mobile studio for the process was also a key element of the sessions. Page's producer instinct turned the whole three-story building into a gigantic studio space. You don't like the reverb in this room? Well, let's move to the next one. Wanna have a lovely view from the window as we nail this truck down? Let's move to the next floor. The drums sound a bit dead here, how about taking them to the corridor and use that space instead? Between May and June 1970, the bulk of Led Zeppelin III was completed. The main session took place at Adley Grange and at the Olympic Studios. The band recorded further overdubs at the New Island Studios in Notting Hill in July. The final stop was Memphis, Tennessee at the Ardent Music Studios some last-minute overdubs and the mixing sessions were completed there. 3 was a different Led Zeppelin experience down to the cover. The art, designed by Zakron, a multimedia artist, featured a rotable laminated disc. Rotating the disc, you reveal different pictures through the holes cut in the cover. At first, Page loved the idea. Later, he came to resent the amount of time it took to mass-produce it. It delayed the album by two months. The music was different too. Born out of different circumstances, it had more time to breathe. And each band member had taken some chances playing unusual instruments were needed. Some of the songs were electric numbers, but most only used electric instruments to dress up an acoustic core. Led Zeppelin had already attempted something similar with Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You, but that was only one song in their first release. This was almost an entire album. Was it all good then? Considering that 3 is my favorite Led Zeppelin album, I'd say that yes, it's all good. And that's it for today. Au revoir! Just fooling around, but talking about the music is not easy for me. The album is more relaxed and pastoral than Led Zeppelin 1 and 2, but the music is still breathtaking, intense, thundering at times. You can listen for yourself. Here, I want to bring out the general picture. 
Throughout the album, there's a sense of urgency that it's almost menacing. An invitation to look twice at what we face. Robert Plant seems to say that our life is misspent focusing on what's obvious. The thing is, we're facing a big prestidigitation trick here and we risk missing out on what matters. This is conveyed in the lyrics subtly. There's stuff characters of the songs are hiding and it seems that pretty soon everybody's gonna know. Multiple characters' viewpoints presented as if it was just one person's. Relationships that make you cry and lose your mind despite the best premises and prospects. Executions held despite bribes and sexual favors. Plant adds another dimension to the songs, obliquely. You will have to listen to the tracks time and again, wondering how to define that ineffable feeling. Then the music. This is not acoustic Led Zeppelin. Friends and Bro E. Air Stomp are the only fully acoustic songs. Gallus Paul has a distorted guitar coming in in its last bit. That's the way has an electric bass appearing at the very end. All the other songs have a significant presence of electric instruments. Let me focus on just three tracks. That's the way is the Led Zeppelin song I love the most, along with the Rain song. The lyrics are vague, talking about difficult relationships. The hard part is due to pressures of the outside world on the couple of lovers or friends. The music is evocative, ethereal, out of time. Page saluted it as a significant breakthrough in his writing relationship with Plant. Easy to agree here. Critic Martin Popov has recently called Since I've Been Loving You the culmination and the last comment the band would ever make on the blues boom. God knows if I love the track, but here's the start of the uneasy part. The intro sounds like the Yardbirds' New York City blues. The first guitar phrase of Since starts in the same fashion, and these were Jeff Beck's Yardbirds, not Jimmy Page's. Soon though, the two songs diverge. After a minute, they are in two different territories. But there's also Moby Grapes' Never. The lyrics begin with almost the same line. Never's initial feel and arrangement is uncomfortably close to Sins's. Some bits of the latter's lyrics are quoted from the later part of Never. But these two songs are different beasts, too. Since I've been loving you goes places. It's much more dynamic, dramatic. It builds up. The music alone tells a story even by itself. Hats off to Roy Harper is where I can't find excuses anymore. The song does sound different from all the songs he draws inspiration from, but there is a whole line-by-line -line reconstruction of where the lyrics have been lifted from. Songs by Booker White, Oscar Woods, Sonny Boy Williamson. There's a link to the webpage where you can read all the details in the description. This is not okay, Top Hatters. Granted, in 1970, it wasn't always easy to research songwriting ownership, especially with the blues. Especially for white British musicians. Check out the story of the Rolling Stones and Love in Vain. After 50 years, though, credit must be due if this borrowing is a form of celebration. Before writing comments to the tune of News Flash, all artists borrow, all in capital letters. Wait a second, I wrote a new song. It was an April morning, and she's buying a stairway to have a There's a writing on the wall. Communication breakdown. It's always the same. How was it? I couldn't be bothered to steal the music as well. Now, if I put out that recording, what would Mr. Page and Mr. Plant do? What would you say? What if I used You Need Cooling, Baby I'm Not Fooling for a soft drink jingle? Would that be okay? 
After all, all artists borrow, right? I could say this is okay only because Jimmy and Robert borrowed from black people. The study of appropriation of black music from white musicians is painfully long, and it shows that if a white man is doing it, it's acceptable. Good old colonialism, right? But if I said this, I'd be wrong. Jimmy and Robert don't get inspired by black bluesmen only. Fred Gerlach, The Arbirds, Moby Grape, Clyde Foley, Arthur Willis and Bert Jansch, all white musicians, all inspirations on three. The people at Polyphonic advanced the theory that manager Peter Grant had turned Led Zeppelin into rock gods, locked in their hotel rooms, they were dehumanized and alienated. Occult, alcohol, drugs, women, music, it was all consumed as a product, with minimal concern. Everything was excused. This would need its own discussion, and while polyphonics is in the sources, I want to close the dances with two observations. One, Peter Grant was not an evil mastermind. Everything was worked out with Jimmy Page, and the rest of the band was told what the plan was later and nobody ever disagreed, because the money and the success kept coming. And two, let's not forget that Bonham, Jones, Page and Plant have never been simpletons. There's a lot to think about here, and I'll leave you doing your own. Make sure that you tell me what you come up with in the comments, with the cops lock off, even. Led Zeppelin III finally came out on the 5th of October 1970. Its reception was a film everyone had seen before. Three became a number one hit in the UK and USA. If there was such a need, the album proved that Led Zeppelin could explore different sounds and still be convincing, but the critics didn't like it. Some maintained that the heavy songs all sounded the same. Some assured that Zeppelin were tired and couldn't be bothered to try harder. Some others accused them of stealing their acoustic sound from the new West Coast acts. Jimmy Page became convinced that the press didn't even take the pain of actually listening to the music. As a sign of protest, Led Zeppelin's next album didn't bear their name, nor any name at all. For or Zoso, or however you want to call it, went on to finally please the critics. Even a broken clock gives the right time twice a day. In the meantime, Jimmy stopped giving interviews for months. The other Zeppelin followed suit. They further retreated in their golden isolation from the outside world. Which is not to say that they stopped parting, rubbing shoulders with groupies of all sorts, including underage ones getting involved in all sorts of mischiefs, real or imagined. Oh, and they didn't stop getting inspired by other people, always improving on whatever material they came across, I have to admit. What does this say about us fans? Well, it's all okay, until the next lawsuit at least. If music could talk, it would say, and I am much happier this way. We talked about Led Zeppelin 3. What else can you listen to? You can start with Bert Jansch Jack Orion. It's one of the albums that inspired Jimmy Page, so you can't go wrong. But perhaps you want a more modern take on folk. In this case, track down Five Leaves Left by Nick Drake. Or maybe you want more of a band sound? Find an incredible string band, the first album by the duo with the same name, will offer you a fine time in Folkland. If you want to explore the blues side of Tree, you can do worse than give a listen to Muddy Waters Sings Big Bill. It's an album recreating all blues tunes in a more electric style. You can also look into the Library of Congress for two blues masterpieces. Sun houses the complete Library of Congress sessions 1941-1942, and Lead Bellies, the Library of Congress recordings, are waiting for you. Finally, let's close the suggestion corner with Peter Gabriel's 1982 album, also known as Peter Gabriel 4. 
If you like the mix of rock, pop and folk music, you won't be displeased, even if here the folk is not Anglo-Saxon. Well, I guess it's time to go now, this time for real. For the moment though, stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye bye! I think it was 1994, my uncle presented me with a copy of Led Zeppelin Remasters. I was 16, but I had never listened to the band apart from the odd song. At the time, the consensus in my circle was that if you wanted something blues oriented, you had to go with something American. So I'm there listening to the compilation and I'm thinking that I like what I'm listening to. But I have a problem. I prefer albums. So I went to the record shop of choice for whoever was a teenager in town back then. New records. You could find all sorts of music, often at a bargain. I still recall how they filed CDs. <sighs> Anyhow, I bought Led Zeppelin 1, 2, 3 and 4 and proceeded listening one after the other. I immediately had a soft spot for 3 because it sounded like a rougher version of some of the progressive rock I had listened to for years. After a couple of months, I returned remasters to my uncle. I know what they say about returning presents, but I explained the situation and he was more than pleased to get the CDs for himself. Which means... Hey zio, mi devi un regalo! Anyhow, Drop me a line in the comment with your story with Led Zeppelin 3. I'm looking forward to it. Simon Mas, music you love.